Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to our second annual program called In Case You Missed It, which is aiming at briefing you on uh, the uh, two dozen or so cases that we think are the most important appellate cases for California civil uh, lawyers to, to be aware of from the uh, past year, from 2022. We've used a lot of criteria to, to decide what cases we were going to choose. Um, obviously, significant legal holdings that are potential traps for the unwary, um, possible cases that may be starting uh, trends in certain respects, and of course, landmark type cases, cases that, uh, that, you, that you need to know about, that you may have heard about, but we'll give you a little bit more insight into it. Um, my name is Kent Richland, and uh, I've been an appellate lawyer uh, since uh, virtually ancient times, 1972. And um, I founded the uh, civil appellate firm of Brainus Martinstein and Richland uh, 40 years ago this year. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by two brilliant appellate lawyers who are colleagues of mine in the firm. Um, first of all, um, Jeff Garola. Jeff is a, a Yale Law School graduate, and he at the moment is one of the two lawyers in the firm who is uh, responsible for maintaining the currency and accuracy of the uh, Rudder Group book on uh, California Civil Appeals and Writs, which is pretty much considered the, the, the Bible of, uh, of California appellate law. And also joined by Rachel Beta. She's a Stanford law grad who was co-president of the Moot Court, Court Program at Stanford and a former Ninth Circuit law clerk of uh, Judge uh, Daniel Collins. So, um, with that introduction, um, I just want to say a few words before we begin that this program is being sponsored by the Beverly Hills Bar Association's litigation section, which is co-chaired by Rudy Lehrer and Rachel Kogan. So if you have any ideas for future programs, or if you just want to get involved with the litigation section, uh, please reach out to one of the two chairs via the uh, BHBA's website. And uh, finally, I want to let you know that the next litigation section program will be on March 27th, a week from today, and that that is uh, entitled uh, provocatively, Substance Abuse in the Legal Profession, a Case Study. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, the registration link is in the chat. And with all that being said, we'll turn to the uh, first case. And um, uh, if you want to switch the slide, Rachel, um, you're on. Thank you for the introduction, Kent. And hi, everyone. It's great to be speaking with you today. I am going to jump right into our first case, which is Garrow versus Block by Lending. This case involves a dispute between a borrower and a lender. The details of the underlying claims aren't all that important for our purposes, but what matters is that plaintiff brought suit in California and defendant then sought to enforce a Delaware form selection clause. Key here, that form selection clause contained a pre-dispute jury trial waiver. California has a policy against such pre-dispute jury trial waivers and generally doesn't enforce them. The issue in this case is how California's policy against such waivers affects the enforceability of the forum selection clause. For background, California courts do not defer to forum selection clauses if doing so would substantially diminish the rights of California residents in a way that violates California public policy. When the claims at issue are based on unwaivable rights created in California statute, the party seeking to enforce the forum selection clause must show either that the form selection clause provides the same or greater rights than California, or that the foreign forum will apply California law. Here, the Court of Appeal held that defendants failed to meet their burden of showing that enforcing the form selection clause would not diminish plaintiffs' unwaivable rights. In other words, defendants failed to show that Delaware would enforce plaintiffs' right to a jury trial. The court's decision was unpublished, so that won't be citable in California. I know what you're all thinking. How did an unpublished decision make it into our civil case highlights from 2022? Well, the California Supreme Court has granted a petition for review in this case, 
and it will decide the question of whether pre-dispute jury trial waivers suffice to negate a forum selection clause. So we wanted to flag that as something to keep an eye out for. Jeff, next slide. Okay, great. So our next case is actually one that our firm handled. Uh, it's Fries versus Superior Court of San Francisco County. This is a wrongful death case in which an intoxicated college student was hit by cars while walking on a highway. Shortly before her accident, she had gotten out of her Uber before her final destination and then declined to get into a second Uber when it arrived. These events all happened in San Diego County, but the lawsuit was filed in San Francisco County where Uber is headquartered. For the convenience of the witnesses and to promote the ends of justice, the co-defendants moved to change value, venue to San Diego. The trial court denied the motion. It reasoned that witnesses would not have to travel because depositions and trial testimony could just be conducted remotely over Zoom. Now, lying in the background of all of this is some pandemic-related legislation. Namely, CCP 367.75, which was enacted in 2021 and is set to remain effective until July 2023, allows courts to conduct remote trials and hearings. Ultimately, the Court of Appeal disagreed with the trial court about the effect of these rulings of these rules on transferring venue. It held that the availability of remote testimony is not a proper basis for denying a motion to transfer a case to a county where most witnesses are located. The court explained that even though the pandemic-related legislation created a presumption in favor of remote testimony, trial judges still have the discretion to require in-person testimony. Thus, the locations of witnesses are not irrelevant. It will be really interested to, interesting to see how this doctrine develops, though, as the role of remote technology continues to evolve in our courts. Um, okay, so now uh, we've got, you're going to get me for a few cases that are all about arbitration, um, which is, you know, a consistently evolving area of law where you see a lot of tension between California courts, which maybe uh, we would describe as somewhat hostile to arbitration, and the FAA, which is uh, very much not hostile to arbitration. Uh, and so with our first one, which is a U.S. Supreme Court decision uh, in Viking River Cruises, um, the sort of background is that, you know, several years back in, in a case called Concepcion, which you're probably familiar with if you've uh, dealt with arbitration agreements, uh, the court, uh, the Supreme Court held that California courts were preempted by the FAA from uh, refusing to enforce class action waivers because class actions are sort of fundamentally at odds with the, the uh, arbitration as a dispute resolution uh, um, procedure. Uh, now, in this case, Viking uh, River Cruises uh, challenged California's uh, um, policy under a Supreme Court, California Supreme Court case called Escanian of, of refusing to enforce PAGA waivers. PAGA is the Private Attorney General Act, which allows people to stand in the shoes, basically, of the state government and sue for labor code violations. Uh, the Supreme Court evaluated whether those PAGA waivers were enforceable. And it actually found that uh, unlike class action waivers, uh, California courts were not preempted by the FAA from enforcing PAGA waivers because it's not the same. You're really standing in the shoes of, of one person, which is the state, uh, and not you know, a whole absent class. But they found, um, in the alter uh, aside from that, that the... Um, uh, that, the, that California's policy against splitting individual PAGA claims from those of the absent um, other, uh, other people, uh, you know, for whom there were labor code violations, uh, was preempted by the FAA. So the court ultimately allowed the individual PAGA claim to go to arbitration and then said that under the PAGA as written, uh, the plaintiff lacked statutory standing to bring the claims of any other uh, absent class, uh, what would be sort of class members under PAGA. Uh, so one thing to look out for with this one is whether the legislature responds in um, amending PAGA to, to, to basically respond to that lack of statutory standing and then grant you know, these, individual, uh, these individuals the right to, uh, to adjudicate other people's claims in court. Uh, the next case is Ramirez v. Charter Communications. 
Um, this was a case where there were multiple substantively unconscionable provisions in an employment arbitration agreement. Uh, courts are particularly uh, strict when it comes to unconscionability in, in the employment context. And so uh, there were a few different unconscionable provisions. Um, I listed out you know, the, this idea of requiring FIHA claims to be brought within one year when under statute it's closer to three, uh, or up to three, I should say. Um, and one uh, awarding prevailing party attorney fees uh, uh, in, right, in response to a motion to compel arbitration. There was a different case called Patterson that had basically looked at one of these prevailing party interim attorney fee provisions and said that um, they would just reform it to make it unilateral. So basically only the employer would ever be responsible for attorney fees. Uh, the employee never would. And that sort of removed the unconscionability. This court said you can't do that. Um, that, it, you know, as written, it is unconscionable. It wasn't within uh, the court's power to, uh, to, to reform that provision. And it also latched onto a particular um, uh, statement in an, in, a, in an earlier opinion called Armendariz, which is like the California Supreme Court uh, opinion, you know, about employment arbitration agreements and sort of everything flows from that one, uh, where they said basically that... Uh, a, an agreement is permeated with unconscionability if there's no single provision that you can strike uh, in order to cure all of the unconscionability, which is kind of interesting because that's not really what the statutes say. That's not really what the Carb California Arbitration Act says, but that has been cited by court after court after court. So now this is going up to the Supreme Court, um, and what we're going to see is sort of this battle of the two um, of the two positions, whether it can be reformed or whether it can't. So we're sort of bringing this one up to your attention for that purpose. Uh, the next one is a case I'm intimately familiar with because uh, I worked on it and sadly did not win. Um, but if this is a case where um, a massage franchise customer uh, came into the store was given a tablet and and it and it you know you fill out your massage preferences you uh, sign like a general release for the franchisee who operates the the massage parlor and then at the end you fill out what's called a, a click wrap agreement which we've all seen it's where you check a box that says I agree and assent to the terms of use agreement um, and and then you know uh, and if you if you click on terms of use agreement takes you to this whole other document that says, you know, when you're using this website or this app, here's what you agree. Um, the Court of Appeal held that the consumer was not on reasonable notice after going through all those massage preferences and the general release of the franchisee that there would be a separate agreement with the franchisor uh, on the other side of that, that click wrap, you know, with the, ter the hyperlinked terms of use. This case is interesting because it's it's the first California somehow the first California published authority to consider that what's called a click wrap agreement. Uh, the other ones you see that are pretty common are called sign in wraps, and it's where you you know you click like create an account, and below that in smaller text is you know by creating an account you also agree to a terms of use agreement things like that. Um, that's a little bit less affirmative assent, and California courts have looked at those, um, and so courts almost uniformly, with almost no exceptions, do enforce these click wrap agreements. So this first California case to ever consider it doesn't do that. So I think what we can look out for in the future is a lot of cases distinguishing this one because it, it, it really is an outlier in that regard. And finally, uh, Evan Scuss v. California Transit. Uh, this was a case where um, the person was a paratransit driver and uh, which is uh, services for people with disabilities under the ADA. And the question was whether the FAA applied or whether it was just California law. And that's not really that esoteric of a question, because if you think back to Viking River Cruises, that actually makes the difference between whether you can enforce a class action waiver, whether you can enforce PAGA waivers, things like that. So it's a, it's a pretty important question. And in this case, they found, you know, based on the principle that the FAA is meant to be sort of coextensive with Congress's full Commerce Clause powers. The court said, uh, you know, these services were provided under the ADA, which indicates an intent, which was also a, a Commerce Clause uh, law, uh, that you're using instrumentalities of commerce, like the highways. 
and that, uh, that these, it was facilitating people's economic activities. Uh, and so for those reasons, even though there was no uh, FAA choice of law provision, the FAA still applied. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And now I'm going to uh, talk about a couple of cases dealing with discovery issues and then one case uh, dealing with summary judgment. And by the way, I just wanted to let you know that um, if you uh, have received the handout, you can follow all of this along. There's, there's rhyme and reason to what we're doing here. There's an outline that we're following. And, um, and if, you, if it makes it easier for you to see where we're going, uh, please feel free to look at that. In the meanwhile, we'll try to give you some guidance as we go along. Um, the first case that I'm discussing is this golf and tennis pro shop case. And it's a case written by Justice William Bedsworth. And if you're not uh, uh, familiar with Justice Bedsworth's work, um, you really should be. Um, he's, he, he's really one of the very best writers of any appellate justice in California. Uh, very entertaining, really away with words, um, often witty, often very funny cases. Uh, not too many laughs in this one, but uh, but it presents a, a real issue that you you should be aware of, um, uh, and the issue has to do with the fact that under uh, CCP section two hundred three zero point three hundred, which has to do with when you um, when you, the time for moving for um, uh, further answers to interrogatories, when does that begin to run? Where Answers are filed, but there's no verification of those answers. In this case, the answers were filed, and then several months later, uh, there were verifications filed. And then several weeks after that, this motion was filed, motion to, for further answers. And the question was, well, was did the verifications, in effect, start the 45-day time limit running or did it run from the original service of the answers? And this case, interestingly enough, holds that the language of the statute is quite clear, that it is only when 45 days from the verified answers, and since the answers weren't verified until the later verifications were filed, um, that was when the 45 days began. Now, what's the difference? What difference does it make? Is this going to happen very often? Probably not very often. But it is important to realize that that's the way this statute operates, and it's kind of tricky. And you may be wondering, what do I do if I if I get answers without verifications? Should I just file within the 45 days from getting those answers? Should I wait for the verifications? The, the fact of the matter is there's no reason to wait, even though the time theoretically is not running, because you probably want to want to get this moving along. and one of the things you can raise in your request for further answers is that the, that the answers that were given weren't verified. And so that can be part of your request for something that's required by law, that is verification. Um, another tricky aspect of this, and that is if only objections are filed um, it, uh, with, uh, with respect to the, um, uh, the answers to interrogatories, only objections don't have to be verified. But if they don't have to be verified, there's no statute that says when the time to file your request for further answers is to be filed. Um, the court mentions this, says it's a problem, doesn't answer what happens. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, the to be safe, you'd probably want to file within 45 days, but um, that other shoe remains to drop. Uh, so it's something to be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next case is a case called Slaya versus Superior Court. And this has to do with um, Marcy's Law. You may remember Marcy's Law was an initiative that um, made as part of the California Constitution the uh, Victims' Bill of Rights, Crime Victims' Bill of Rights. And, um, and there's not a whole lot of case law on exactly how the rules in Marcy's law apply. This presents an interesting problem because in this case, the issue was whether the Marcy's law provision that says that the victim of a crime cannot be forced to give a deposition 
by the alleged perpetrator of the crime um, under Marcy's law. Here, there was both a civil case and a criminal case uh, at the same time, the, between the same two parties. And um, there was a request for a deposition of the, the alleged victim in the civil case. The question was then, does Marcy's law apply to the civil case or only where there's a request for deposition in a, in a criminal case? Well, you don't see a whole lot of depositions in criminal cases. And so the argument was, you know, it wasn't intended to apply under those circumstances, but um, the court does a real close examination of the legislative history or the initiative history. And it concludes that no, that if in fact the, the, the intent was to uh, have it apply to a, a deposition requested in, in a civil case, it would have been made much more obvious in the in the material, the legislative material, nothing indicated that, and and the court goes into some detail about how of absolutely central importance the um, the deposition is to civil cases. So this case answers an interesting and I think a little bit of a difficult issue um, how Marcy's law applies, but it may come in even handier for you in any situation where you want to establish how important it is that uh, your client be allowed to get a deposition of the other side, because there's a lot of good language in here about the centrality of the deposition to, uh, to civil litigation. Um, finally, next slide, please. Um, a summary judgment case that presents a real interesting wrinkle in the law. And this is a, a case that was written by another very, very good and interesting writer uh, on the California Court of Appeal, Justice John Wiley. And Justice Wiley was a, uh, for many, many years, uh, a, a professor of law at UCLA School of Law before he took the bench. And he has paid very close attention to his aims in writing opinions. And his opinions tend to be extremely clear, very, very carefully structured and written, but without a lot of footnotes, um, you know, really trying to pare it down and in quite simple language. I mean, he's got an almost Hemingway-esque um, approach to writing opinions. Um, so it, his, his um, opinions are worth reading just for the fact that they're, that they're so accessible. Um, and this case presents a, 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 a kind of a, a new twist on the old case of D'Amico versus Board of Medical Examiners, which you may remember held that where there was an admission made during discovery that a, a party couldn't create a triable issue of fact when a summary judgment was brought by taking the opposite position that had been taken in the admission during discovery. Now, in this case, the plaintiff was asked a, 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 a question regarding a, a, a critical uh, aspect of their case. And the answer that was given during discovery was, quote, unsure. Um, the, when it then came time for summary judgment, the other side brought a, a, a claim of summary judgment. In, the plaintiff said, um, well, wait a minute. I'm claiming that in fact, this defense actually exists and here's the facts that, uh, that are behind it. And Justice Wiley's opinion holds, no, the D'Amico rule applies even under these circumstances where there's just been a kind of evasive answer given a discovery. That is a party can't now be sure about something that they had every reason to be equally sure of at the time of discovery. Um, so it's an interesting variation on the D'Amico theme. Now, there are some cases that say D'Amico only applies where there's been a clear admission and that simple evasiveness or unclarity in the, uh, in the discovery process doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, invoke the D'Amico rule. This case doesn't directly disagree with those cases. And I think there are some distinctions that can be drawn with those other cases. But uh, this is something clearly to be aware of, and it really counsels against 
being overly clever in one's answers to, um, to discovery requests. Um, and next, next slide, please. Um, the final case that I'm going to be talking about is a, a case, a, a summary judgment case called Field versus, oh, I'm sorry, we have a, the, I think this is the wrong slide on this one. I don't know if it, Jeff, see if there's a, this, the earlier slide, can you get back to that? Um, if not, um, we can just go on from here and I can tell you about the field case. I know that this geyser case will be the next one that, uh, yes. that Rachel will be talking about. But the- uh, Field is the one you just spoke about. Oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Field is the one I just spoke about. That means that we're ready for Rachel to talk about geyser. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak to you now about a couple of anti-slap cases. Uh, the first one I'm going to be covering is Geyser versus Kuhn, uh, which is a California Supreme Court case that announces some really important anti-slap related rules. So in this case, a real estate developer purchased a home in a foreclosure sale. The former owners, as well as an advocacy organization, stage a protest on the public sidewalk outside of the real estate developer's home. In response, the real estate developer filed some civil harassment petitions against the former owners and a director of the advocacy organization, who then moved to strike the petitions under the anti-slap statute. Now, the anti-slap statute only covers certain types of protected activity. Relevant here, the anti-slap statute covers conduct that furthers the uh, free speech in connection with the public issue or issue of public interest. Uh, in a prior case, Philmon, the California Supreme Court articulated a two-step inquiry for deciding whether conduct meets that standard. In the first step, which is the step that's at issue in this case, the court asks whether the public issue or issues, or it asks what the public issues or issues the challenged activity implicates. Here, the Court of Appeal had held that the protests didn't involve a public issue because they were about the private conflict between the real estate developer and the former homeowners, and that the owner's motivation for protesting was purely personal. The Supreme Court reversed. It held that while the protest concerned personal matters, it also implicated public issues related to controversial real estate practices. In support, the court pointed to several contextual considerations that informed the expressive meaning of the protest, such as the fact that the advocacy organization got involved and that dozens of people with no connection to the former owners participated in the protest. The Supreme Court also articulated two important rules. First, Philmon's first step is satisfied so long as the challenged speech or conduct, considered in light of its context, may reasonably be understood to implicate a public issue, even if it also implicates a private dispute. Second, Philmon's first step calls for an objective inquiry without deference to the anti-slot movement's framing or personal motivation. So these will be some really important rules to keep in mind for those of you who handle anti-slot cases. Um, my next case is also, also an anti-slot case. Uh, this one's Manlin versus Milner. Uh, in this case, an LLC member sued an, the LLC's managing member, alleging that he had engaged in some self-dealing activities. The managing member cross-complained, and then the original plaintiff cross-complained back, this time alleging further self-dealing. Specifically, he alleged that the managing member had diverted funds from the LLCs in order to pay his personal legal expenses. The managing member moved to strike under the anti-slap statute. The main issue here is whether the diversion of the LLC's money to cover legal expenses qualifies as protected activity for anti-slap purposes. For background, an anti-slap movement must show that the challenged allegation or claims arise from protected activity, such as, for example, certain litigation activity. To determine whether a challenge allegation or claim arises from protected activity, the court asks whether the protected activity was the alleged injury producing act forming the basis from the claim. Here, the court held that appropriation of the LLC's funds to finance litigation did not qualify as protected activity. The allegation of self-dealing completed the claim. 
why that self-dealing was done here to fund litigation formed no basis for liability and therefore could not convert the suit to one arising from protected activity. In other words, because no element of the claim depended on the purpose for the diversion of the funds, the fact that the purpose was to fund litigation was irrelevant to the protected activity inquiry. So this is a really helpful case, I think, in figuring out exactly what that arises under uh, standard means. The next case I'm going to be talking about is a, a settlement case. Um, and the facts of this one are pretty straightforward. Here, plaintiff sued Subaru under California's Lemon Law. Subaru offered to settle pursuant to CCP 998, but plaintiff did not accept the settlement offer. Plaintiff, plaintiff did ultimately prevail at trial, but recovered less than the amount that Subaru had offered to settle for. Now, under CCP 998, if a party offers to settle, you know, within certain time constraints, et cetera, uh, and the other party refuses, and the other party fails to obtain a more favorable judgment in court, the offering party is entitled to recover post-offer costs and expenses from the other party. Now, there are certain requirements for what makes a 998 offer valid. It must be in writing, has to contain the terms and conditions of the settlement, and include a provision allowing the offer to accept the offer. This case is, what, is, is about what exactly those requirements mean. For example, plaintiff argued that the 998 offer was invalid because it did not specify whether he would be deemed the prevailing party for purposes of an attorney fee motion. The Court of Appeal rejected that argument, both because 998 does not include any such requirement and because the offer here specified that plaintiff would receive his costs and attorney fees. Plaintiff also argued that the 998 offer was invalid because it did not expressly offer to pay expenses. But the Court of Appeal rejected that argument as well. It explained that if, if sorry, it explained that plaintiff would have been entitled to recover expenses if he had accepted the offer, regardless of whether the offer itself was silent on that matter. And finally, the court also held that the offer was reasonable in good faith. Among other things, this was demonstrated by the fact that the offer was higher than plaintiff's ultimate recovery. So this case gives a lot of good guidance on what exactly needs to be in a 998 offer. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple cases involving the right to a jury trial uh, and they come out uh, in opposite ways. So it's kind of interesting to see where they diverge. The first case is LaFace versus Ralph's Grocery Store Company. And as background for this, uh, there was a wage order that was issued um, several years ago, basically saying that um, when employees had downtime, they needed to be able to have uh, reasonable seating accommodations. And uh, a Ralph's cashier sued uh, under PAGA saying that Ralph's didn't give the cashier um, reasonable seating accommodations. So the sort of threshold question uh, was whether this was something to be tried to a jury or to or just to the court. And interestingly, even though PAGA was passed in 2003 and had been on the books for almost 20 years by the time of this opinion, it is an issue, a matter of first impression. So no court had ever actually determined whether PAGA claims were legal or equitable. And this court ultimately determined that there is no jury right. Um, you may remember from law school, it's one of those things that like just always floats around in my head, but uh, you, we look back to 1850 when the Constitution, the California Constitution, was first ratified and, and ask whether uh, the claim is either one recognized as a claim at law at that time or is akin to a claim uh, recognized as being one at law. And, and, you know, as with a lot of other things, we look at the substance and the gist of the claim, not necessarily how it's labeled. In this case, uh, the court found significant that the, uh, that a plaintiff, you're, it's really a stand-in for an administrative action by the state, uh, which, for which there wouldn't be a jury trial, right? So that was sort of first and foremost in the Court of Appeals' mind. But the court also looked at the fact that for PAGA claims, there's a lot of like, equitable factors weigh really heavily in, in um, determining whether to, to afford relief under PAGA. So for those two reasons, uh, the Court of Appeals said there is no jury trial right uh, and affirmed the judgment, uh, finding that uh, in that case, uh, the reasonable seating accommodations weren't 
required because uh, cashiers are supposed to be doing other tasks when they uh, have a lull at their at their station. In the next case uh, called ZF Micro Solutions uh, is it is is interesting because it, it'll be interesting to see whether and how far this this holding sort of goes uh, in terms of future cases that might be a little distinct but otherwise assert the same cause of action. In this case, it was a breach of fiduciary duty claim by the corporation itself against uh, directors and the director's principal uh, for, for destroying, literally destroying the corporation uh, through a smear campaign. And uh, so the court, you know, looked at that same, uh, the same question, which is, you know, were, would this have been recognized as a, as a legal claim versus an equitable one at common law? And the court distinguished other cases for breach of fiduciary duty uh, that have arisen in an explicitly equitable context, specifically ones by minority shareholders, whether against uh, directors of the corporation or majority shareholders. And it contrasted this case to that by saying, in this case, um, this is a type of, uh, of action that was recognized at common law. Uh, uh, a director's duty to the corporation, you know, already existed before these statutes came into place. And uh, so, so, and they also, you know, focused on the fact that the corporation was only seeking money damages and not equitable relief. So sort of the questions, you know, that, that, that come from this now are, you know, would, it, would the result have been different if they were asking for something over and above uh, of money damages and also, you know, they, they close the opinion out with a paragraph that any court wanting to distinguish uh, this case is going to latch onto, basically saying that the result might have been different if they were alleging a breach of fiduciary duty uh, cause of action with the same parties, but not based on destroying the corporation, but instead like misappropriation of funds, things like that, where you would have maybe equitable considerations or the business judgment rule. Uh, uh, coming into play, and then and then maybe taking it out of the realm of 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 uh, a strictly legal claim and possibly into uh, the equities. Oh. Is this one? <laughs> Oh yes, this one is me. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a really interesting case because um, it involves the sort of occasionally very tricky question of appealability. Um, and you know, if, if anyone who's ever had to appeal a judgment probably knows that California has a very strict sixty-day jurisdictional deadline, after which there's just, with the narrowest of exceptions, absolutely no right to appeal. Um, in this case, the police officer uh, sued for a writ of administrative mandate, and the court issued an order uh, denying that, um, uh, denying denying the petition. And then, at some later time, about a month later or so, entered a judgment uh, to the same effect. And the court of appeal had to look at whether it was the order on the writ of administrative mandate or the later judgment that was the appealable order. And the court determined that because the uh, order determining the, peti the petition for writ of administrative mandate, that's a lot of words, uh, completely less, left nothing to be uh, resolved. And it, and it didn't even explicitly contemplate the entry of a later judgment. Um, the court found that there was, th that was, despite how the, uh, the order was styled, that, order was the appealable final judgment uh, for appeal purposes. So because the police officer did not um, uh, didn't appeal from that order, but instead only appealed from the later entered judgment, that notice of appeal was filed late, and the court of appeal dismissed the uh, dismissed the appeal. Uh, so this is this has gone up to the California Supreme Court. Uh, this this issue has been sort of bouncing around the courts of appeal for quite a while now. I actually have uh, an appeal pending before uh, uh, 4-2, this one was out of 4-1, where it presents the same issue. Um, and so it's definitely something that that comes up quite a bit. 
So the, the California Supreme Court is going to finally step in and resolve this issue, uh, which again is really important because appealability for being such a harsh rule is also one that it needs to be as clear as possible, you, you, given that fact. So uh, soon we're going to have some some good clarity on this, and we may even get maybe some ac action by you know the legislature in in codifying how these um, how these orders need to come out or need to be styled to make it clear. Yeah, how, how scary is that situation? Where because how many times have you had a minute order that basically you know disposes of all the issues in the case? And you're just waiting for the judgment to be prepared and filed, and everybody waits around for a while. I mean, if in fact it's the minute order that really is the thing that has to be appealed from, we all better know that um, because otherwise we're in trouble. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about some cases having to do with evidence, a couple of cases uh, dealing with expert opinion, and one dealing with hearsay. The first one, uh, one of the ones dealing with expert opinion, presents the question of whether under evidence code 721, an expert can be cross-examined on scientific, educational, professional materials that the expert has not even consulted or had anything to do with uh, previously. Uh, can that cross-examination in, in effect bring that material before the court and before the jury? Um, and Interestingly enough, Section 721b3 seems to say, yes, as long as it's established in the first instance that this is reliable authority, um, yes, the expert can be cross-examined about it. How then did the trial court make this error? Well, it turns out that if you look at the legislative history of 721, um, and particularly the Legislative Council's digest for when the it, the statute was first enacted in 1965. The whole purpose of this statute was to prohibit anyone from being able to, a, a party from being able to bring in this kind of expert material, scientific material, that an expert had not relied upon. And uh, so A and B of 721 um, sort of say you can't do it. And C says, yes, you can. And so uh, it's really important to realize that the, there was a change of mind, a change of theory at some point in time. That was in 1997 when the statute was amended to add subsection B3. And it, in effect, undid the things that the other two portions of the statute were intended to, to accomplish. Um, so the answer is, is clear now under this case, and I don't think there's any question about it, that the intent of the legislature was to permit this kind of material to be a basis for cross-examination and to be brought in before the court um, via cross-examination. Um, next case, please, next slide. Um, this next case is Klein versus Zimmer. And, um, this is a case where there was a, uh, a refusal by the trial court to permit the defense expert to testify that, um, that there were alternate causes than those to which the, the expert for the, pl the plaintiff had testified was the cause, obviously the claimed misconduct of the defendant. And, um, and the judge said, well, look, you know, in medical malpractice, you the expert has to testify that a, a particular cause is the cause to a reasonable medical certainty. And since this defense expert wasn't willing to testify to that, just was testifying that this other cause was a possible cause, uh, it can't come in. Um, the Court of Appeal does a great job of explaining that's not how it works. Um, the reasonable medical certainty cause of act ca claim is something that must be shown by the plaintiff. The plaintiff must show that there was causation to a, me a reasonable medical certainty. But since the burden is not on the defendant, the defendant only has to raise a reasonable doubt as to whether it is the case that it was a reasonable medical certainty. And therefore, yes, the defense can present evidence simply that there are other possible causes because those could indeed raise a doubt. Now, what I found particularly interesting about this case was that the Court of Appeal held that the refusal to permit these witnesses to testify was structural error. That's pretty unusual in a case where what you're talking about is evidence. Structural error, of course, is the kind of thing where 
for example, the denial of a jury trial, where you don't have to show any prejudice because it goes to the very structure of the trial and therefore not permitting the particular process to, to occur is structurally you know, removed the right of the, of the particular party. And here the court says that also applies in this kind of situation where the entire theory that the defense was pursuing here was eliminated from the trial. In effect, the defense wasn't allowed to, to actually present a defense. And the court says that's structural error. So if you're ever presented with this kind of issue as to whether something can be structural error outside the context of a, you know, a regular due process kind of, uh, kind of context, um, take a look at the Klein case. It's, uh, it's an interesting analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, finally, uh, a case that involves an issue of hearsay. This is another case by Justice John Wiley, uh, who, um, again, writes a very, very clear opinion and really establishes exactly what you need in this case to uh, the admissibility of a police report that itself contains hearsay statements. This was a case where the, uh, a facility for the disabled was being sued by a resident who claimed um, that the facility had not, had negligently failed to protect uh, the resident from sexual assault by a handyman. And there was of course a police report as a result of all of this. And the police report contained statements of the defendant's employees that indicated that this handyman had harassed female employees. Um, so the police report was arguably itself hearsay. The statements of the people in the police report was hearsay on hearsay. Um, Justice Wiley explains why all of that was admissible. And he explains that the police report is admissible as a business record. The statements of the residents were admissible either as um, statements uh, admissions of a party, if, if in fact they're considered employees and, and uh, identified with the defendant itself, or simply as non, not, uh, for the non-hearsay purpose of showing knowledge about the uh, dangerous propensities of the handyman. Um, it's, a, it's a great case where you've got a multiple hearsay issue because again, it so clearly explains how multiple hearsay can work and how it can, uh, an objection can be overcome. Um, and um, that's it, next next slide. Um, Rachel, you're up. Hi, I'll, I'll be now talking to you about a few various general liability cases. This first one has to do with respondeat superior. Um, it's Perez versus city and county of San Francisco. And in this case, a police officer left his department approved firearm unsecured in his vehicle after returning home from an assigned training session. That night, the gun was stolen from his car and shortly thereafter, the gun was used to kill plaintiff's son. Plaintiff sued the municipality and others for the officer's negligent failure to secure the firearm. As we all learned in law school, respondeat superior holds an employer liable for torts of its employees that are committed within the scope of employment. Here, the police department's policies required officers to secure their guns at all times. Nevertheless, an employee's misconduct may fall within the scope of employment if it is reasonably foreseeable by the employer in the context of the employer's particular enterprise. Based on that standard, the Court of Appeal here held that there was a triable issue of fact as to whether the officer's negligent storage of the gun while off duty fell within the scope of employment with the police department. Given the centrality of firearms to the enterprise of policing, a jury could reasonably find a nexus between the department's enterprise and the risk that one of its officers would negligently fail to secure an approved firearm upon returning home from work. However, the court made clear that its reasoning would not extend beyond the instances of negligence and that the situation would be different if an officer intentionally mishandled his firearm. This case serves as a helpful reminder of just how expansive scope of employment is, but also tells us that there are some limiting principles. Next slide. 
So the next case uh, is Hussain versus Club Demonstration Services. This is a slip and fall case against an independent contractor that provides food samples at Costco. Uh, the sample vendor's contract with Costco limited, limited its maintenance obligations to just the 12 foot radius around each sample table. And plaintiff's fall happened outside of that boundary. The issue is whether the sample vendor nevertheless owed plaintiff a duty of care. For background, a business that holds its premises open to the public owes a duty of reasonable care to those who are lawfully on the premises regarding risks that arise within the scope of their relationship. Here, the court held that the sample vendor was part of the business enterprise that invited customers to the overall premises of the Costco store. And based on that special relationship, the sample vendor owed a common law duty of care to customers in any area of the store where they were likely to shop. That duty was not constrained by the vendor's contractual arrangement with Costco. Now, my first reaction to this was that that seems kind of unfair. Could a sample vendor whose maintenance obligations were specifically limited to a 12 foot radius really be liable for, for falls anywhere? in Costco, Costco's pretty giant, right? Um, however, the court gave some guidance as to why sample vendors may not ultimately be liable in those situations. It explained that while the contractual 12 foot radius was irrelevant to the duty inquiry, it would be relevant in determining whether the duty of care was actually breached. The breach inquiry evaluates whether the context conduct was reasonable under the circumstances, and the contractual arrangement would be one of those circumstances. This is all I'm going to be thinking about next time I'm at Costco. Okay, next slide. Um, so this next case, this is a uh, California Supreme Court case that has to do with premises liability. Uh, here, an 18-year-old who lived with his parents in invited a friend over without telling his parents or asking if he could do so. The 18-year-old and his friend rode motorcycles on a motocross track that apparently was on the parents' property, um, and they got into an accident with each other. As a result, the friend brought negligence and premises liability claims against the parents. This case involves recreational use immunity under which landowners generally own no duty of care to keep their property safe for others who may enter it or use it for recreational purposes. There is an exception, however, when land or landowners expressly invite someone onto their property. The issue here is what constitutes an express invitation from the landowners. Was it enough that the landowners consented to their child living there and didn't prohibit their child from inviting people over and then their child invited the friend? The Supreme Court said no. The qualifying invitation under section 8463 may be made by a landowner's authorized agent who issued the invitation on the landowner's behalf, but the standard is not satisfied when a live-at-home child acts without the owner's knowledge or express permission. Thus, this case clarifies the contours of recreational use immunity while also providing some useful guidance on when agency relationships may exist between parents and their live-at-home children. Uh, so the next case that I'm going to be talking about is a very long opinion on Prop 65. Um, you all probably know what Prop 65 is, but it's that Thing that you see warnings for when you go into a parking structure or a grocery store or whatever that tells you about uh, known carcinogens or um, uh, reproductive health um, uh, you know, substances that are bad for reproductive health. Uh, in this case, the Court of Appeal overturned the trial court's findings that um, Amazon did not have a duty under Prop 65 to warn that certain skin creams um, for skin whitening or lightening contain mercury. Uh, the court found first that the trial court erred when it when it determined that the expert needed to test multiple instances of the product. Uh, it was enough to test one and to come to the expert conclusion that the ingredient was in fact an ingredient uh, intended to be included, which would trigger the duty to warn, versus a contaminant that wasn't supposed to be there uh, uh, and where, there, where the duty to warn would, would not necessarily have arisen. It then determined that 
Prop 65, uh, even though it says knowingly and intentionally, that knowingly uh, includes constructive knowledge, um, not merely actual knowledge. And this was based largely on the uh, protective purpose of Prop 65, and ultimately the finding that it would have you know, allowed retailers to uh, basically put their head in the sand and uh, ignore uh, uh, the presence of these substances they needed to warn about. Um, it then found that actual use didn't need to be shown. So they didn't need to come in with uh, specific uh, examples of people who had purchased the product and used it. And that was a sort of common sense thing for the court. They said, you know, you can presume that people are going to use the product for its ordinary and intended purpose. Uh, and in fact, they cited a civil code statute that I uh, found very amusing, and I will read it to you. It's section 3546, which is things happen according to the ordinary course of nature and the ordinary habits of life, which is a California statute. <laughs> uh, and finally, the court found that the Federal Communications Decency Act uh, is the kind of it's the it's the law that mm, is actually on review before the Supreme Court right now, but protects uh, things like Google for the content of the speech that uh, that is other people's speech that that they just allow you to access. Uh, uh, that did not exonerate Amazon because uh, what they weren't forcing Amazon to do in this case was to go in and edit the third party sellers uh, listings, but instead to as the vendor as the as the marketplace uh, to post its own warning. Uh, and that was an independent you know, duty that belonged directly to Amazon. Next one uh, is, a, is a much more straightforward case. It's also just kind of a fun one. Uh, somebody sued uh, a bong manufacturer, uh, a water pipe manufacturer, saying that uh, they had a duty to warn under Prop 65 that uh, uh, cannabis smoke, marijuana smoke, uh, is, is a known carcinogen. And the court uh, found sort of in, again, what I would describe as a pretty common sense holding uh, that, you know, it, 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 for Prop 65, it has to be an inherent feature of the, the, the thing itself, the bong itself. Uh, here, this was a reasonably foreseeable use, um, but it was not a, a necessary use. You know, it's not the only thing you can use it for. And the bong itself you know, didn't actually contain any of that, of that carcinogen. And so you could think of an example like um, you would have to maybe warn for like a paintbrush or a paint scraper because someone might use it with lead paint. You know, it's a sort of a slippery slope. Um, but they did leave open, there's a bit of a gap, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how this develops. Um, what if the product did only have one possible use, um, even though it didn't contain a carcinogen? Uh, the, you know, there's a bit of a gap there, and courts may come in and distinguish on that ground. And um, now I'm going to discuss uh, two cases, very important cases in the uh, area of employment law. Um, uh, the first one is the Naranjo versus Spectrum Security Services case, California Supreme Court case. Um, Justice Kruger wrote the opinion. She's another excellent writer. And this is a quite a complicated case that she makes very clear. And it really shows you uh, how California's law, which you know expressly says that you must try to look at, at these kinds of issues in a light that is most favorable to the employee, um, how it works. Here, the issue was, there were a number of issues, but they all centered around the question of whether a, um, a requirement that an extra hour be paid to an employee who had been denied a, a meal or rest period, whether that was a penalty or wages. Now, you would think that that's kind of technical. Why is that important? Well, the fact of the matter is, if it's wages, then there are all kinds of things that flow from that. It has to be reported as wages. It must be paid immediately to the employee when they cease employment. There are huge penalties involved if, if wages aren't treated that way. And essentially, the court holds that this thing, which is really treated as both a penalty and as wages, because it's wages in one way, that it must, in fact, be treated as wages, must be reported, and all the other uh, things that flow from that. Interestingly enough, the court it does say that that doesn't mean 
that this was a lawsuit brought to get wages, and therefore there was a, there is a more favorable prejudgment interest rate that's applied. The court goes the other way on that, and so this is a case that really draws a very very fine line with respect to to uh, this one issue. It's worth reading just to see how uh, a court can can maneuver that kind of fine line. And the final case next next uh, one is. Um, you know, those of you who, who have done any employment law cases are no doubt familiar with this C's Candy Shops case from 2012, which said that an employee could round up um, the time that an employee had worked. The employer could do that in determining the wages, round up or round down. You worked, you know, uh, 15 minutes of an hour, then you rounded it down to the hour. If you worked uh, half an hour, it was rounded up to the hour. So um, this court says, at least in a situation where it seems that a party can actually show that they haven't been properly co compensated at the time they bring their lawsuit using this kind of rounding up or rounding down process, that is not proper. And the rounding up and rounding down can't be done. Um, the there's a concurring opinion that says it's not just wrong in this case the C's candy shops rule is wrong just plain wrong and uh, it would hold that that should be overruled the supreme court has never ruled on this it's been followed by many many courts of appeal this case may be the start of a trend that says that the C's candy ruling is not going to be followed in california so it's worth keeping an eye on um, we're a couple of minutes over, but um, we really appreciate the time you've, and attention you've uh, paid to us. Uh, I know there's a, a couple of questions, but I, I'm afraid we don't have time to answer them. But you can contact any of us uh, at, at, our, at our firm uh, if you have questions concerning anything we've discussed, and we'll be happy to talk to you. Just give us a call or write us an email, um, and, uh, and we'd be happy to respond. Thank you very much for your attention. We really appreciate it.